The following interview is with me and Professor Dario Nardi, world-renowned author of the groundbreaking book, Neuroscience of Personality. His newest book is called The Magic Diamond, Jung's Eight Paths to Self-Coaching. We discuss this book and a ton more. It's a very funny, authentic, genuine interview from Dario Nardi. Anyone who's either an expert or beginner or just enthusiast in typology will want to watch this interview and will definitely get something out of it. So without further bother from me, please enjoy. The newest book, Your Magic Diamond one, um, mm. that's like, it's a beast. It's like 400, it's like 500 pages. I saw, I haven't bought it yet, but I have seen the reviews and it's just like this thick. So is this like your magnum opus or what, what's going on with that book? Uh, you know, I think it's like the the, the result of coronavirus. <laughs> um, no, it, it really, it actually isn't. Uh, so I, I think as a fellow INTJ, you can appreciate this, that I had materials to start with, first of all, accumulated over 10 years. I created one demo chapter, which was introverted intuiting. And then I did a second one, like a template that was 20 pages. And I did a second one that was extroverted thinking. And I'm like, okay, these two worked out well. I got the kinks worked out. I send them to a few people. Uh, I sat in an INTJ group that's part of the British APT, British Austro uh, Association of Psychological Type. Right. We're just INTJs, um, British INTJs, oh. except for me. And, um, and so got feedback on that. And I'm like, I'm just going to replicate this six more times. And, and in the process, like after sending it out to people and stuff, I had a couple months and I started layering in more mm -hmm. when people gave feedback. So they're like, oh, you need like a page on systems or a page on organizations or whatever. So for me, one is I have a lot of experience writing. The coronavirus made everything like really quiet so I could focus on stuff. And then just being efficient with templates. And, and if a person looks carefully, they'll realize there's a lot of templates. And, and it's like there's a lot of parallelism. There is. And I've, I've read a lot of books on it. And it seems like, you know, like per, I've read Personality Hacker and I've read kind of all the other stuff. And it's really just a, you write one type and then you just switch the order and you fill in, you kind of have this. I mean, how many times can you describe an I? Yeah. I mean, eventually in a different order, it, it kind of manifests itself differently. But uh, yeah, I get that. And uh, I'm excited to read it. So that just came out this this month, right? Yeah, like uh, September something. Yeah. Okay. How has that, how's that the, how is it being received online and everywhere? Good, good. No, I mean, I have, I, you know, it's always, it's always a challenge with Amazon to increase the number of reviews because Amazon really has some impressive uh, AI-based filtering for text analysis and stuff. No, they really do. Um, I, I know somebody who's an executive at Amazon. So it's, is it Jeff? Uh, is it Jeff? No, not, no, it's not <laughs> a super high-level person. It's just like just upper mid-level. Yeah, I know, right? If only. Um, and, uh, but nonetheless, it's, um, you know, but I mean, in terms of reviews and all of that, it's been great in terms of videos, uh, stuff like this. I've really enjoyed doing it. I've taught two courses already on it through Personality Hacker. Oh, sweet. They, those were only advertised internally to Personality Hacker's own, like, members so far. Okay. Yeah. And so they were, they were 12-hour uh, courses spread out over a month with like a follow-up we'll do in December or something. And that's oh, wow. Cool. Okay. Yeah, which was really good because people use the packets and I got like more experience. What is it like to actually take a group of people? And um, I think between the two groups, there was one person with sensing preference. <laughs> okay. So how did they deal with it? <laughs> oh, well, and she was very young too. So I'm not really sure. I don't think a statistical sample of one's probably enough yet. To <laughs> um, but there, there was a good spread of like intuiting types. Otherwise, all of them were there, you know, even multiple ENTJs who apparently thought it was like a, the price was worthwhile. So it's, um, yeah. Wow. That's rare. Yeah. I think. I, I know, right? If you get ENTJs showing up, then you know it's got to have a little bit of seriousness to it. Yeah. Did they challenge you? They push back or? No, no, okay. not really. Yeah. Okay. I would say your best book uh, in terms of like your groundbreaking book is obviously the neuroscience of personality um, basically showed a significantly link between personality type 
and brain function. And I would personally say that for me, it solidified the, the reality of type and it really changed the discussion on the validity and value of the MBTI assessment. So I just want to know like what compelled you to take on such, such a monumental task that basically more or less, you know, proved typology. Well, you know, it, it was it, it, the personal side of it is that around 2001, one of my type colleagues, uh, German type colleagues, Sandra Hirsch, uh, made an offhanded suggestion uh, that perhaps um, somebody in the type community ought to be doing neuroscience research. And the person who had been doing that before at University of Chicago uh, died in an untimely way from cancer. And so her publication and research was cut short. Um, they fast forward four years after that, I got some grant money after winning a teaching award and they're like, you have to use it for research or teaching. Uh, and it happened to be just enough that I could buy the brain imaging equipment. So I'm like, why not? And it so happened that I knew at UCLA, uh, the psychologist who was the head of human subject research for California, uh, like the, you know, the UC board at the time and did EEG research. So I met with him a few times and I watched the training video and like all of that. And then I had some fun with students and it was so convincing the very first afternoon, like we hooked up the very first student who I still know to this day, who has gone on to become a pharmacist and like all these things. And, and you know, he, when he would talk and listen, like the, the, the anterior temporal lobes would light up on the EEG and he's gonna make a decision between options and it's like then the left prefrontal cortex lights up. It turns out not everybody is as clean as that, but he was like really just like textbook brain. And, and that, uh, you know, after that I'm like, okay, this is worthwhile regardless of what I find, even if it has nothing to do with type. I did refine my protocol. Uh, there, there was really a feeling uh, and I, there, I had a student working with me who really looked over the, not in any numerical way, but just generally looking over the data. Uh, a very skeptical INTP and she's like, I don't think there's any connections. And I think I said, I think you're right. Like the brain is just like, there's something different. And, and I mean, what we got in terms of brain activity always made sense for the person in front of us. But the question was like, in terms of their, like, were they more extroverted or argumentative or something like that, the, you know, verbal, the visual, but, but it really took me sitting down and actually going through all of the data and see that, oh, it's statistical in nature and it's significant. Um, and I really want to emphasize to people who've only seen, uh, first of all, if you've only seen the Google video, please know there's another video I did in Sweden, which is up on Vimeo, which is like far more recent and talks about like brain networks and all of this stuff. It's like much more up to date. I'll, po I'll post that in the comments. So we'll, they'll yeah. have access to that. Yeah, and I can send people, in fact, on Facebook, I have a whole like multi-page thing that's like every single link on the internet that I know of that I put up there for it, like all the different talks and articles and whatnot. Um, but when I did the research, I saw, okay, it looks promising. And I say in the book, you know, it's a pilot study. And at the time it was, um, I've had a lot more people in different countries and all age groups and all of that since then. And, and you know, I want to emphasize that whenever we're doing, we're looking at the brain, we're talking about a snapshot of a person in time, even if that snapshot like brain networks have a reliability of about two years, but still it's a snapshot. And then we're looking at the developed self because I saw some, I mean, I'm really happy that I started with college students, not just because it was convenient, but I thought like they haven't undergone type development. So it should be pretty straightforward. Uh, and it was, but um, when I looked at now the majority of people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, it seems like career has a really big impact on people's brains. And that's, uh, and it always makes sense, like how they're using their brain for what they do or what culture they're from. Like British and French brains are different from uh, Indian brains. Australian and American brains are pretty similar to each other, but otherwise. So there's like, it is ongoing. And people who really wanted to say like, oh, this is it, or like, like just like develop like a brain test right away for type. And I'm like, it's going to take at least 10 years to do something like this. And, and now I'm actually, it's just around 10 years and I have enough data for all of the types. I mean, we're talking about anywhere from 15 to 60 people of every type. 
Um, getting those ESTJs is not easy. Um, and then when they do come in, they're not really, quote, like standard issue ESTJs <laughs> necessarily. Um, but it, it's been a great experience. And, and it definitely, you know, takes the conversation to another level. Like the, the, there's very, even with five factor model, they have only a couple studies that they can point to. And the studies really actually don't show very much that's conclusive. Okay. So, so I'm like, yeah, you know, and, and I come from a background that says mathematically types exist. Like there are these things in dynamic, the brain is a dynamic system. A human being is a dynamic system or living systems. Um, there are things called attractors in nature. And, and in social systems and in physical systems, there's things that strange attractors or attractors exist. And that's just a fancy math word for a type. And it is just a pattern of behavior that, that is like has boundaries mm -hmm. and ha is typical. It's not predictable. Many attractors are not predictable, but they stay within a certain boundary space. And it's like a gravitational well or, um, you know, just like even the seasons as we go through the seasons where we're that's an attractor. It's an annual one that repeats. No year is the same as any other year. But we, we say there are seasons. And there's, um, so there's a pattern that's there that repeats. So in my mind, like it was never an issue, are there types or not? It's only people think there are no types if they're just stuck with statistical analysis as their only tool. Right. Um, but I come from a background that has networks, you know, as part of the understanding and all networks, I mean, social networks, all of that all have attractors in them. So it seems very natural to talk about types. The brain is a dynamic system. So of course it has types. Okay. Yeah. So you know, ESTJs would be a perfect kind of punching bag for this, but not really. But, you know, in terms of the responses you get, like the pushback or some of, from the skeptics, things like that, mm -hmm. um, what would you say the most common thing you hear that is a skeptical response? And then how do you convert the non-believers? Um, you know, the only skeptical responses I've gotten are from uh, like tech science graduate students. Um, and not a lot, even just like three or something that I can think of over the years. Uh, one of them was actually satisfied once I, I answered her questions. She's just like, oh, well, why didn't you say that in your presentation? And I'm like, well, because it's a popular presentation, not a technical one. But they were good questions. Like, she deserved to have them answered. Okay. Um, then, you know, there's always, I think the other two were just haters. And that's... Uh, in terms of like neuroscience colleagues, they don't have any, I've, like I've literally never encountered a problem in presenting it because the way I analyze the EEG data, uh, the kind of device even that I'm using is the EEG, the protocol I'm giving them, it's like it's all really standard stuff. It's just I'm casting a net at the same time that asks besides like sex and age and whatever, it's like, what is your type? And, and it, when needed, like taking people through a type process, uh, like clarification process, which I'm sure is not 100%, like it can't be, but mm -hmm. I'm doing my best. Um, and then, you know, using some techniques to sort and figure out. And, you know, repeatedly, I find stuff that I read in the literature. I say everything I present in terms of like functionality, different parts of the brain. I'm like, you can look that up on Wikipedia or in a neuroscience textbook. Like it's not new. I did find some things at times, like one guy was just like absolutely in his background was neuroscience and he's younger, again, a graduate student, one of them. And he's like, oh, you know, you, you put that the brain is highlighting up in the central regions when people are remembering stuff like that's completely wrong. And I'm like, no, actually there is a paper that shows that when people do long-term recall from memory, that it passes through the parts of the brain involved with physical motion and sensation. And, and this is also what I saw in my lab. That doesn't mean that's the only circuit that handles memory. It isn't. You know, the temporal lobes are involved, but they're involved for everybody. So I'm just like highlighting that for the people who have, you know, this sort of kinesthetic bias in those parts of the brain that actually it's sort of weird, but like that kind of memory they're going to re remember more easily, like dance steps or whatever it is. Like and that's the um, What's that? The SP temperament? It could be the SP temperament. I would say for the most part, but I know like in a, an ENFP who's very acrobatic, you know, like can do cartwheels and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> that's just his thing. I, I don't know. Like he's not like the other ENFPs, but he's definitely an ENFP if you talk to him. 
Okay. Um, yeah, he's got that abstract language thing, like off the scale to like counteract the the, the somersaults. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so there are always some people like actually ESTJs uh, may have actually those circuits in the central region pretty active. You know, they're, they are sensing types and mm-hmm. they're... Um, they may have that, but yeah, you know, is a chance that ESFP or ISTP is going to have that higher than say, um, uh, INFP for sure. Like no question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there are some things that you can definitively say within this whole, like, I'm not going to say hundred percent, any of it's a hundred percent, but like you can easily say ISTP versus INFP. Definitely. They will have this, se- this section of the brain will definitely light up more, more than others. Or, yeah, or there'll be networks where there are hubs that are much denser than others because you can look at the different skills that or the, the brain supports that aids with, um, and people are going to develop the skills that meet their practical needs, like in their job and in their culture, but also meet their psychological needs. So yeah, I mean, there's always going to be some variation because the ENTP who's a therapist is of course going to have a little bit different brain than the ENTP who's an engineer. So there's no such thing as like an ENTP brain, but time and again, we look at the kind of regions in terms of what's densely wired, what's more active, and we see that people are using the stuff, using their brains in a way that meets their needs. Mm -hmm. And that's, so yeah, I mean like, you know, ENFP and ISTP are really pretty different from each other. Okay. And unless it's a really weird, like left-handed artist ISTP, Which, you know, is there, they exist, yeah. um, you know, we're, they're definitely different than the ENFP. So okay. that's, yeah, and the ENFPs themselves come in different flavors. Uh, but then again, that depends um, on career and, and it's going to be variations. You know? So what does this deal with, um, like, not, I'm not saying mistypes, but basically why are there certain types that get mistyped more? Like, you know, I, INFJ. Why mm-hmm. do so many people claim I'm an INFJ, but like statistically it's very low? Oh, you know, I mean, there could be a few reasons for that. It's like, who's interested in the topic? Mm-hmm. And it's, um, I, I think IN types are just really drawn to, to type in general. Uh, and that, that's, so there's a bias there. Um, I think that there's, uh, you know, the, the way Linda Behrens describes it is, is interesting. She's like, you know, for types that have a very holistic experience, it's sometimes really difficult for them to sort out what's what. And, and you know, for, especially for, for NFs, this idea, oh, yes, I could be like that. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that people experience you that way from the outside, which is why I believe it's important to gather multiple data points when doing type assessment to have 360 assessment. I'm like, if you're not clear on your type, ask your mother. Now, that doesn't work for every person, of course, uh, but a lot of people, the mom is going to be, I know somebody like this recently, and the mom is like, no, you're clearly this type. Like, that's, she's like, I've known you all of your life. Like, that's for sure. Um, Spouse, coworkers, um, not, you know, some of them may have biases or whatever. We put on a certain mask, but like all the people who know me personally, including other INTJs are like, the way I am in person is, is not my, my public, you know, sort of song and dance pony show self. And that's, um, so I would say that's important. And then having multiple models, like not just relying upon the cognitive processes, because I think that can get confusing. At times it's like, it's a rabbit hole. You know, it's like, oh, am I using like introverted thinking or is it introverted sensing? And they're trying to pick out a behavior. And I'm like, first of all, type isn't about behavior. Otherwise, we would be using five-factor model. Like, it's not that. Um, and, and so, like, you know, I, I consider temperament all the time. I consider interaction styles. Um, and then just, like, all of the examples in my head from almost 30 years of using type. And that's, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it, and so all of that goes into sort of the hopper. And, and yeah, no, I mean, sometimes I'm wrong with the person. Like, I'm one letter off. But, but that, you know, gets clarified if I keep interacting with the person. I, I think some of it is the internet has, has created a lot of virtual typing. And to me, like, I find virtual typing difficult. Like, if I were just sitting here with you and you didn't say you were INTJ, I'm like, how am I going to know that? 
Hmm. I, I don't see you move really. I don't see your, your presence in the room. Right. And that's very different when I'm with somebody personally. Like it, maybe that's the way I learned or maybe it's just more like deep data in a sense, as opposed to like surfacey kind of data. So I'm very much not one of those people to like type celebrities or anything like that, because I think that that's, um, it, Jung would definitely disapprove of that. Like that, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, that is funny. That's one of my favorite sites is like personality database. It types everyone all the time. It's celebrities, cartoon characters, people from literature, history. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. I, don't, I mean, the arguments go back and forth. It's, it's all like user created, so. Um, some people are definitely not INTJs that get, get typed that way and stuff like that. But um, so explain how people can like how they can benefit from type development or what, what type development means. Mm. Um, well, sort of the way I opened the book and my attitude for a while is that if we want to talk about personality, we need to talk about development because that's something that's going on all the time. Um, for a while, I mean, certainly for like a century, actually, in, in academic psychology, personality was defined as a stable set of traits or characteristics, actually, uh, characteristics. And, and it's only in the last decade or so with these very long-term longitudinal studies, looking at people from childhood, teen years, you know, adulthood, elder years, that they found that and they weren't even using type. I mean, they're using, uh, you know, five factor model or one of the other ones that's out there. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, I think it's still fair to look at and saying like within a five to 10 year window, people don't change very much. Like, so it looks like personality is stable, but when you compare someone at 15 to page se to age 75, they're actually quite different. And then the question is how are they different or what's going on? Um, and so I've had the benefit of being able to say for probably half the types, there's at least 40, 30 to 40 people of that type of all different ages. And even if I factor out career, like if you, if I have 40 people and I put people into two different career groups or four different career, there's still enough people to look at age and I'm seeing changes that happen with age and themes that come up. And so that's, so I really see it's like, it, you know, it would be fine if everybody were just doing type and they're all 20 somethings, uh, you know, then that would be one thing. I think people are sometimes confused about my type because like, I'm sorry, I'm 50 and you're 25. Like life happens. And so I, I think that the, the development is really important for the, like that reason, like accuracy kind of reason, understanding. Um, the other thing is that that's its superpower in a way like other type, you know, other models like disc doesn't really say anything about development like five factor model is not about development i mean they could sort of say well you shift over your life like your trait profile but that doesn't tell me where i need to go or something like that or what's next i feel that that type gives this with this principle of opposites that it gives this, and the opposites can be anything. They don't have to be sensing, intuiting, or whatever, like literally anything in our lives. Like if we, if we ignore our, our physical health, for example, in, in order to do like work or something like that, like that's gonna come back to bite us at some point. Like that, that's not some like theoretical like speculation. We all know that. Mm -hmm. um, so Jung just like turned that idea to personality as well as life in general. And, and gave us a language. And, and that's why I would say type gives us a language. It gives us a lens to see what's going on with people. And, and, you know, then we can describe them. And it gives us that lever. And the lever is the cool part that says, like, oh, if you're INTJ, like, how is your introverted feeling? And, and to say, like, the feeling domain is like an area where you want to pay attention to because you might make a big mistake there. Right. Yeah. Right. And I would say then, and then to give people a sense of like, okay, how do I deal with that? And how do I make the most of it? Instead of seeing it as just like a perennial weakness, like, can I actually bring that into my life? Can I create space for this other function and, and integrate that somehow? So that like, I have a cooler life, a better life. Right. And I think, I think integration is what Jung called that. Like, lifelong trying to integrate some parts of your life or some functions that are hidden or on the shadow side. And I was thinking, I wonder if you'll um, agree with this, that when you're first talking about type with people or, and then breaking down the cognitive functions of their stack, it's helpful to just do the top four 
before you go into the bottom four, do you find that you, you wouldn't want us to talk about all eight in the shadow side right away because it's too confusing? And mm -hmm. also on the same side, do you agree with like the, the BB model with like archetypes and stuff like that? You know, I, I, I did the book with Linda Barron's uh, that works from BB's model and I'm fine with it. Uh, I don't personally use it a tremendous amount in terms of like, you know, like the parent and the Senex witch and so on. I think it provides a good language and um, it's like a starting point for people to help understand it. Um, I don't normally, I, I'm not normally the person who uh, rolls out type to people, newbies. Like I, even, even like working with personality hacker, all of those people are already experienced and know the eight function model and all of that. I have taught courses at UCLA, but I use eight keys to self-leadership. Right. So it just, they do an assessment at the beginning that's not a type assessment, it's just like profile of your eight functions. And then they read those chapters where they're like their strengths and then they go and read ones that are like, you know, third or fourth one down, something like that. And, and I don't try and like push them into, to say like it has to be exactly this or that uh, until people say like, hey, can you show us the theory or whatever it is. Otherwise, I, I think a lot of people have a sense naturally like, oh, this is something I need to work on or I hate it or whatever it is. And, and I'm like, okay, well, then you can work on it. Or like maybe, you know, you're going to be encountering people all the time who use introverted sensing, for example, like in you hate it, but how are you going to deal with it? So that's a, let's explore it a little bit. So I feel like the theory is always something that it, is, it doesn't actually need to be rolled out in the beginning. And many times I do to like be more specific, I generally, if I'm going to introduce the functions, I mean the eight, then I would just start with like sensing, intuiting, thinking, feeling. And they sort of rank those and work with those. And I'm like, okay, now let's go to the level of eight. Mm -hmm. And by then, and I have like a, a fold out where they can see like the ones that it, like a TI and FE are opposite each other on the table and so on. So they have a sense is like, and I, and I would say things like notice that the ones diagonal to each other areas where they might actually work together or be opposing. Um, but even with that, I usually start off, I lay out those eight and then we do an exercise that asks, where do you see the cultural bias? And in terms of like your social environment and, and also like your immediate family members, like what was it like growing up? So we get that out of the way at the beginning so that they understand, oh, right, like for American culture, it's going to be T-E-S-I for men. Mm -hmm. It's like the actual standard. And then like the Hollywood ideal is going to be something different, but it's, it's there. We have the discussion for like 20 minutes and then we move on to, uh, and I usually do that after they get the results of their brain imaging. If I'm working one-on-one -on -one with people. And so it's, uh, it takes place within the context of their skills and their personality is revealed by the brain imaging. So even then it has an organic quality to it because, you know, not every INTJ is the same as every other one. And that's, um, I, you know, so I, I, even then I approach it in sort of organic way. I mean, I have the models very fixed in my mind, but I don't see the need to impose that on people. Gotcha. And the one thing that I always try to differentiate when I'm talking about MBTI is the part that unfortunately doesn't get done very often, which is like, here's your profile and go run with it. Like you're, a, you're the commander, you're the ENTJ. And it's like, well, that doesn't help people and they have bad experiences with, you know, being typed. But what MBTI can do is in your book, and I think um, Hartzler wrote a book as well um, mm -hmm. with the eight functions of type where it's like literally if you need to develop like stage one SE, here's some things. And then if you're already kind of experienced, here's some advanced tactics. And I go, this is where MBTI like separates itself where it's, you can lay out like a 30, 60, 90 plan for mm -hmm. developing type. And that's why I say like, it's just, it can work for anybody, even like someone who's 50 years old and it's pretty well developed. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was um, inspired by their booklet when I did eight keys to self-leadership that, that there's like basic intermediate and advanced exercises to get familiar with each one. And, and I'm like, yeah, that's, it's a great way to do it. I, I would say the other thing too, I want to mention is that um, 
you know, both, both within the type, professional type community and the, the uh, American Psychological Association have ethics standards. And one of those things is you don't tell people their type because it's a different kind of instrument than, than uh, measuring traits. I mean, it's a certain kind of instrument that's supposed to be telling people about their personality in, internally. And so the, the recipient is the final arbiter of what they are. And I always, always, um, I mean, especially if it's not all facilitated face to face or, you know, like Zoom or whatever, that uh, they get the top three types. Even just taking an assessment, I'm going to show them the top three. And it is their responsibility to read through three different descriptions or, or whatnot and, and sort for themselves or to say, like, no, can I look at a fourth one or something? And because, you know, it's there's very much like, especially America has this test and tell mindset. Like, I'm going to take you know, really like, oh, yeah, in 20 minutes, like this piece of paper should be able to tell me all about who I am accurately. And I'm like, this is like fundamentally about like fundamental about you. Like, I think one, it deserves more than 20 minutes and two, it deserves some personal engagement. And so I'm a big believer in engaging people to at least reduce that 16 down to three. And I would never, I mean, I'm never somebody to say like, oh, you're this type or you're that type or I'm going to professionally type you or something like that. Like that's literally not my job <laughs> in any universe. Okay. So, but you can still walk them through the type development if you're pretty sure after they've agreed, this is, this has to be me. You're like, all right, well then we'll go with that. We'll just, just we'll take your word yeah. for it. Yeah. And, and in fact, that, that can be very clarifying. So if a person says like, oh, you know, I really relate to, and I'm thinking of someone in particular, extroverted sensing and extroverted feeling. And they've got the judging and perceiving functions there, but they're both extroverted. And the person in front of me is very extroverted. So I'm like, okay, let's, like, let's start with that or something close. But the way I present it now is they're going to see the other functions and they're going to see something like introverted feeling or maybe introverted sensing. And by the time we get through that facilitation process, they've had a second and a third look. And they realize like maybe they've just been taking that for granted or it is them, but they haven't been allowed to express or develop that. Um, I think there, there's, I mean, there are certainly folks who are like extremely extroverted and extremely introverted. And, and so they are maybe relying more upon, you know, it's like not everybody has the same developmental path is what I'm putting it down to. And that, that really can make a difference. Like, you know, there, there's people who are like, what is it, Asperger's? And there's like a bunch of published papers actually on, on type and, and Asperger's. And it's like, yeah, I'm an NTJ. I don't relate to Asperger's at all. Like, I don't have social impairment. I'm, not, I'm never a social person in high school. Uh, is that I wasn't shy. Um, I had no social skills, but I wasn't shy. <laughs> And, and so that's, um, you know, I didn't initiate interactions and I was worried like, oh, I'm going to say something stupid or nobody actually cares what I'm going to say or doesn't <laughs> understand. So why even bother? Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't where somebody else might, you know, and that's, um, and then I also lived part of my life in the Caribbean, which is like super extroverted culture. Okay. And that's, uh, which was a great, I mean, it's very Barbados is very ESFP culture. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, it's very different. I don't say they get a lot done, but they have fun. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. So um, recently on LinkedIn, I saw that you are part of a pretty big um, conference for the Australian APT. What, tell us about that project or what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's, um, which are actually maybe news to the younger folks on the internet, but since the late seventies, there have been a number of international organizations that support type, uh, and which originally for psychologists and counselors and coaches and whatnot. And, but it's grown to be some also enthusiasts. And this, so these are professional organizations. There's Australian association of psychological type. Uh, there's a British one, American one, a French one, um, a Japanese one. They're not in every country, but they're around. And um, they, they're really about the bringing people together and uh, presenting papers. A lot of the papers are not theory oriented. They're really about practice. Like I work with tech people in Silicon Valley. What's a great way to roll out uh, a type development concept to tech people? like those kinds of things. Sometimes they are reporting on studies or whatever. Sometimes they're fun stuff. Um, 
like really doing an in-depth study of a particular musician or artist or whatever and presenting for 90 minutes on the life of this person and their work and quotes and all of that. And, and that's, I mean, it's not my cup of thing to go to all the time, but sometimes it's cool and it's usually within the vein of describing something about type like development. And that's... Um, so what's your speech going to be about? Are you speaking at it? I, I am, yes. I, I usually speak at these things. Um, I actually have several coming up, and I'm trying to remember what is it that I'm speaking about. <laughs> and it's next week. Um, I have a file and a folder for it. I, I'm pretty sure it's on the magic. Oh, no, so this is what it's about. It, it, it's, yes, it's about the magic diamond and, you know, sort of highlighting the new book. And the idea of the diamond, that what's a way that we can present type to people from the very beginning that isn't about this linear polarity between sensing and intuiting or whatever, but instead opens up the shape that's more Jungian that says at the bottom of this, so think of four quadrants, a diamond with four quadrants, the bottom quadrant is undifferentiated. Then we've got the opposite facets that are like sensing, intuiting, or thinking, feeling, or whatever. And then we have a top facet, and that top facet is integrated or transcendent function. And what does that look like? And so we know, I mean, in terms of undifferentiated, there's not a lot to put there. You know, it's like you put a, like an icon of like little baby or something. <laughs> then for thinking and feeling, that's what all the materials are always about, like handing out stuff to people that describe the type and maybe give them something to do to develop skills or whatever, but usually not so much. I really want to create the space and from the very beginning that invites people to think about, oh, how do I use sensing and intuiting together in my life in a satisfying way? Because, you know, there's this idea that, well, one, people may just be completely oblivious that there's another way of doing things. Or they may be aware of it and they think it's stupid or they're aware of it and they think it's cool. Um, like I would be terrible at extreme sports, but I enjoy watching extreme sports, some of them, because I'm like, that's amazing. And I couldn't do that, but I appreciate how hard it is. And then there's the space where we can bring them together. And I think that that's where the actual magic happens. So magic diamond, mm -hmm. where magic happens in life. And if people are just going to carve out a space, so like a lot of INTJs I hear from, they carve out a time in their life uh, like a daily or weekly basis where they're going to do exercise or they go hiking or, you know, some like sensing activity, but that isn't actually integrated into the rest of their life. It's like, there is like a, like a pressure release. And, and I'm like, how can we bring things together in a way that's more integrated? So to be more satisfying. And I'm not saying people should do that from the beginning. Like differentiation is good. Jung said it was inevitable. Uh, specialization is the whole story of the first half of life. He's like, you've got to get on in society. You have to grow roots. Like you, you have to plant that seed and to grow. But like in the second half of life, especially, what do you do? And I think for a lot of people, no matter what type, they can take their second and third functions and bring them together pretty easily. If they only have some examples and encouragement and their lives allow it to happen. So that's mostly both what the book is about and I'll be laying out a little bit more like for them. It's like, how can you introduce type in like a, like five steps or I think there's seven steps. Um, I won't go over seven. That's dangerous territory. And, and just be like, you know, what, what are the ways to, to introduce type that really lead people in the direction of development, including, you know, cause I'm sorry to say, but a lot of the type, literature especially the professional stuff is like way so positive like oh. super positive yes um not that not the discussions on the internet but like the, the actual type literature people get in organizations and whatever it's like one line at the end of a paragraph about how it might you know this function might malfunction sometime and and i'm like no 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 you go back to jung's personality types mm -hmm. like three quarters of what he says about every type is like really negative stuff all the ways it can go wrong, a little bit wrong with some benefits, a lot wrong, and then like disastrous. And so I'm like, that's, that's part of it too, looking in the, the mirror, seeing the shadow stuff, uh, and then showing the people the way out of that. And so that's what we were doing in the, the last two courses I taught was taking people through that process, strengths and then uh, pitfalls and then integration. Okay. That sounds like a, that's, 
an awesome speech and I would definitely look forward to reading it in your book. So you have that coming up. What other, do you have another book? What other projects are you working on? Um, yeah, I'm always working on multiple projects. Uh, you know, I, I used to say each one is a distraction from the other when I get bored with it. I need a break uh, or I just need to like, I don't know what goes in this chapter, so I need to go away from it for a while. Um, in practice, uh, there's three things I'm working on. Um, one of them is slowly but surely working through all of the number crunching for neuroscience of personality 2.0. Because I have all the data and I've thankfully in some ways like stopped collecting data during this COVID-19 thing. Mm -hmm. Like I have like three people I've seen in the past six months. So I'm like, good, like I can actually stop and not feel guilty. No, there's one more person. I can't do the statistics. Um, so I'm doing that. And I think that that book, to be frank, is going to be less type related than maybe type people will want. But don't worry, there's still going to be type in it. So it's, uh, it's just going to be a lot more stuff about networks and development um, and things like career and culture. Because I've gotten enough people from UK, France, Australia, India, whatnot. It probably won't come out though till next summer at the latest because I want to collect a few more Norwegians mm. to like fill out like some of my database. So there's, and I know it's just going to take time. It's just going to take time. So that's one project. The other project is I'm halfway through uh, a book on, um, uh, what is it? It's uh, Awaking Your Inner Viking Shaman. Okay. And that's, uh, it's all about using uh, drumming for trance and the techniques around that. Uh, it recorded in the Norris sagas, like uh, this practice called Seder, which is not the Jewish Seder, by the way. Although it's also a religious group ceremony, but a different, totally different culture. And just like what's involved with that and how one goes through that. And there's a whole Udemy training course that's coming out with it too. Nice. It's, um, yeah, yeah, I've been working with uh, ENFP and ISFP on it. So it's been very like multi-function, multi-preference effort to make that happen. Uh, and then the third one is um, the third book. I've been writing a series of books that are fiction books. It's like they're interactive novellas. And, um, and so this is the third in the series. And that's, uh, and they're like 1930s um, horror mystery with some magic in it. Of course, you know, to counteract because the horror has got to come from somewhere besides the depths of the human psyche. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, and uh, in, in, in each book, in the first book, we follow, or you are, because it's interactive novella, you are an ISTP. Okay. And in the second book, you are an ISFJ. And yes, ISFJs can be heroes. And I chose an ISFJ specifically because I wanted to demonstrate that. Um, and then this third one is an ENFP. Uh, and this, this character is going to be more work than I expected. Because it just extroverts create something extra in every scene. And extroverted intuiting is not my shtick. Well, you said that extroverted intuiting is the hardest one to get in the flow state. It's a really tough one to nail down, right? It seems like it. You know, I, I, I don't want to be like, oh, you can't go there or something, because I've seen examples of it. I saw an ENFP when she like went into her memory and reviewed all of her ballerina dance steps and all of that. But then she'd been doing that since... For, for 15 years, from age three to 18. So I'm like, you're given a pass on that. And that's, okay. um, but yeah, if a person's brain is really chaotic and then in this idea of flow state where everything is synchronized, that's very different. And that's, um, but you know, the funny thing is I found that the, the flow state stuff is actually harder for all people past young adulthood. And that's, um, it, it's not that they, they don't, they do get into a flow, but it's a very, you know, when they're doing something, but it just looks like they're asleep because it's just like a mind. No, you can do it in your sleep is the phrase. And I've seen it. I've literally seen like photo retouching person for years and years. And he's like on the computer and he's doing stuff and just looking at the EEG, I would say, oh, this person is asleep. <laughs> Yeah, and that's, and that's why he left his career after that. That was actually the, like, the, the, the puzzle piece or like the straw that he was like, yes, I knew it. Like, I have to get out of this profession. It's killing me. Wow, that's a revelation. Okay. Huh. And I've had some things like that. It was even, what is it, 10 years ago, more than that, I came out with this like 
uh, love therapy app on re- like gauge your relationship, which I didn't keep up with in terms of like upgrading it for the new iOS's. And there was like six couples we interviewed for it to like that we filmed to like using the app and five of the six broke up within just a couple months of doing the film shoot. So I'm like, I, your interview. Well, I'm sure it's not that, <laughs> but, um, Most it was that. interesting to see people using the app and what it had to say about them as a couple. And it requires actually two people to use the app. So it's, um, I'll, I'll update it again at some point. Just haven't gotten around to it. And right. we'll it's one of the project, one of the projects that's on hold. Okay. Well, Daria, I really appreciate you being here. Um, is it, it's, is it Dr. Nardi or is it just Daria? What do people call you? I want to clarify that. Um, you know, I always tell my students that you can just call me professor Dario and that's, oh, okay. um, I'm cool with that. Uh, for, for much of my, actually before I turned 18, I had my stepdad's last name, which was power. So I was Dario power. Mm. Um, that, that's a difficult name for other kids to make fun of, by the way, it did not work out well for them. Yeah. Um, yeah, but no, so I, but then I reverted back to my actual like legal family name. So it's, uh, yeah. So I, but I've just always had Dario and that's, that's okay. Well, I do consider myself, you know, a student of yours. So professor Dario, I thank you so much for taking the time. I know you, before you got on, you had like 19 different projects going on and people were, crunch time for us, your project. So I appreciate you, you being here and I'm going to put um, in the comments section, I'm going to put, um, I think you're going to give it to me too, but some of the links where people can find you, um, I want to put a link to um, join that conference you're speaking at. And then of course, to your, your books um, as well. So appreciate you being here and uh, definitely let's do it again sometime. Cool. Thank you for having me.